Hello and welcome back to my vlog. Uh, part 21. There's a lot of parts to this thing. We're, I think, halfway there, maybe more than halfway there. Section 14, how I vainly tried to explain the nature of flatland, part 1. <clears throat> Thinking that it was time to bring down the monarch from his raptures to the level of common sense, I determined to endeavor to open up to him some glimpses of the truth, that is to say, of the nature of things in flatland. So I began thus, how does your royal highness distinguish the shapes and positions of his subjects? I, for my part, noticed by the sense of sight before I entered your kingdom that some of your people are lines and others points, and that some of the lines are larger. You speak of an impossibility, interrupted the king. You must have seen a vision, for to detect the difference between a line and a point by the sense of sight is, as everyone knows, in the nature of things, impossible but it can be detected by the sense of hearing, and by the same means my shape can be exactly ascertained. Behold me, I am a line, the longest in line length, over six inches of space. Of length, I ventured to suggest. Fool, said he, space is length. Interrupt me again, and I have done. I apologized, but he continued scornfully. Since you are impervious to argument, you shall hear with your ears how, by means of my two voices, I reveal my shape to my wives, who are at this moment 6,000 miles, 70 yards, 2 feet, 8 inches away, the one to the north, the other to the south. Listen, I call to them. He chirruped, and then complacently continued. My wives at this moment, receiving the sound of one of my voices, closely followed by the other, and perceiving that the latter reaches them after an interval in which sound can traverse 6.457 inches, infer that one of my mouths is 6.457 inches further from them than the other, and accordingly know my shape to be 6.457 inches. But you will of course understand that my wives do not make this calculation every time they hear my two voices. They made it once for all before we were married, but they could make it at any time, and in the same way I can estimate the shape of any of my male subjects by the sense of sound. But how, said I, if a man feigns a woman's voice with one of his two voices, or so disguises his southern voice, that it cannot be recognized as the echo of the northern? May not such deceptions cause great inconvenience? And have you no means of checking frauds of this kind by commanding your neighboring subjects to feel one another? This, of course, was a very stupid question, for feeling could not have answered the purpose. But I asked with the view of irritating the monarch, and I succeeded perfectly. What? cried he in horror. Explain your meaning. Feel, touch, come into contact, I replied. If you mean by feeling, said the king, approaching so close as to leave no space between two individuals, no, stranger, that this offense is punishable in my dominions by death, and the reason is obvious. The frail form of a woman, being liable to be shattered by such an approximation, must be preserved by the state. But since women cannot be distinguished by the sense of sight from men, the law ordains universally that neither man nor woman shall be approached so closely as to destroy the interval between the approximator and the approximated. And indeed, what possible purpose would be served by this illegal and unnatural excess of approximation which you call touching, when all the ends of so brutal and coarse a process are attained at once more easily and more exactly by the sense of hearing? As to your suggested danger of deception, it is non-existent, for the voice being the essence of one's being cannot be thus changed at will. But come, suppose that I had the power of passing through solid things so that I could penetrate my subjects one after another, even to the number of a billion, verifying the size and distance of each by the sense of feeling. How much time and energy would be wasted in this clumsy and inaccurate method? Whereas now, in one moment of audition, I take, as it were, the census and statistics local, corporeal, mental, and spiritual of every living being in Lineland. Hark! Only hark! So saying, he paused and listened, as if in an ecstasy, to a sound which seemed to me no better than a tiny chirping from an innumerable, innumerable multitude of Lilliputian grasshoppers. And there we stop with part one of how I vainly tried to explain the nature of Lineland, section 14. More tomorrow, make it a great day, and bye for now.